So as Robert mentioned, uh, I work at the Bureau of Mines and I'm also pursuing a PhD at MSU. So this is really my PhD work. So I'll kind of try to set up the structure of uh, how does that all fit together. So there's kind of some disparate parts of this talk, but they do actually all fit together. So we'll see how that works. Uh, I also wanted to point out just all the folks who have uh, contributed to this research. You know, uh, the Nature Conservancy really was the driving force behind starting research on beaver mimicry, uh, stream restoration, and then DNRC, uh, the Water Center, and other folks have all joined in. So kind of the first question I usually get when I have a title like this is, what's beaver mimicry? What are you talking about? And of course, this is what we're talking about. Uh, Bucky the beaver for, no. This is not what we're talking about because he's not doing stream restoration. Um, instead, we're talking about putting structures out on the streams to try and simulate the effects of having beaver in the system, even if there's not the habitat there to really support them naturally. Um, so you can see here where these structures are in the stream and we're getting more inundation of the floodplain during high flows as a result of that added complexity. And uh, here's our site on Long Creek. So this is somewhere in Oregon. But this is our site on Long Creek where we have more of this constructed riffle uh, type structure built with gravels in there, but again creating that pool behind the structure and inundating the floodplain over here more during high flows than it could do before the structures were put in. Um, also, we have got Alkali Creek, where we didn't have a bunch of cobbles to work with and really not much willow. And so here they use sod mats and juniper boughs jammed down with the excavator in order to create the structure. So these are not intended to be permanent structures. You look at these and the cobble size, the D50, uh, is supposed to be engineered to be moved by, I believe it's a 20 year event. So that these are not something that are going to stay locked in place forever, but that they can create some complexity in the system and try and create the habitat uh, over the long term. So why do people want to go out and put these structures in? Uh, well, if we consider that beaver mimicry is probably a kind of similar to natural beaver structures, uh, we can look at the research that has been done on natural beaver dams. So this, first I'm going to present Pollock et al.'s version of the world, and then I'm going to pick it apart a little bit. So you've got beaver dams out there. Uh, you reduce the flow velocities. You raise the water level, so you increase the stage in the stream. Uh, you create more pool habitat out there. All those are very direct results of putting the structure in place. But of course, there's feedback loops involved. So we begin to increase aggradation, that is depositing sediments in the pools behind these structures which is interesting to think about if you want to sequester something. Um, we also increase the floodplain access by raising that stage up, making it easier for the stream to get out of the channel and get onto the floodplain during high flows. That reduces the pressure on dams. You blow out fewer dams and maybe more beaver move in. You begin to create more stable habitat for the beaver. Um, also by increasing the floodplain access, you can increase the sinuosity of the stream, which by definition will decrease the slope, you know, as you increase the length, uh, the slope has to go down, which will decrease the power and again, uh, re help the dams to hang around. By raising these groundwater levels, we can also increase groundwater recharge. Uh, and the riparian vegetation likes having more groundwater, more shallow water that it can get to, it tends to green up. Uh, and by having increased vegetation, we can then lower stream temperatures because of the shading that's created. And also the root mass can allow for undercut banks and lower width to depth ratios. And also once we increase that groundwater recharge, eventually that water has to come out somewhere. So the idea is then we can have localized upwelling, which helps with low flows and helps to lower uh, stream temperatures in the summer would also increase temperatures in the winter, but that's okay. So that is the Pollock version of the world. And as I got to looking at this, I had a few little nitpicky things like, well, if you're getting out on the floodplain, you're also going to increase riparian vegetation. But more importantly, by raising water levels in the stream, you might increase groundwater recharge, or you might not. I mean, you could have a very low permeability sediment and not see that. Also, 
in order for this to do any good, you need to be able to store that water and get that water to move out to the stream when and where you want it. And so you need to be a little more tentative in that connection. We can also look at the fact that increased groundwater recharge, if it happens, if you're in a strongly losing stream and the depth to groundwater is say 20 feet and it brings it up a foot, the riparian vegetation really doesn't care. And so that's again a more tenuous relationship and also if we do get more at vigorous more extensive riparian vegetation it's going to be using more water and so it's going to be in direct competition with this localized upwelling and getting that cool water to come out in the late summer and so obviously some trade-offs involved so when looking at something like this what I like to think about is a water budget and so here's just a control volume of a uh, alluvial aquifer some headwater stream, you've got groundwater coming in through the alluvium, you've got groundwater coming in laterally into the area, you've got recharge occurring and surface water from the stream flowing into the aquifer. On the outflow side, we've got groundwater coming out of the screen through the alluvium, we've got uh, surface water, you know, groundwater discharging to surface waters, we've got evapotranspiration, and we've got changes in storage. And this is kind of how we think about an aquifer over a specified kind of control volume over a particular period of time. The trick is that we care about more than one time. And so as we continue to think through time about how these budgets work, it's not about a single budget that's stationary or a steady state version, but rather this dynamic water budget that we need to be thinking about. And so in my study, uh, through my PhD work, we're basically taking three different routes to look at uh, the effects of beaver mimicry stream restoration. The first is to develop conceptual models of uh, groundwater flow and beaver mimicry treatments. The second is to monitor two sites. We've got one on Long Creek, one on Alkali Creek, where we've been monitoring for four years and then to develop site-specific groundwater models of these areas to better define that dynamic uh, water budget. I am not going to talk about that today because I haven't done it. But <laughs> someday we can come back and have that talk. But the other stuff we'll go through today. So the first step there was to develop conceptual groundwater models. And the reason we're doing this is to just basically do the math, to say, does that even make sense that you'd think that by putting this structure in, you're going to take this spring's high flows and have them come out this summer. I mean, you both have to have the place and the timing right. It's a little bit tricky to think about. So we're just basically doing the math that can we increase surface water inflow and will that increase surface water outflow or what else happens with the budget. Um, also, we want to understand the effects of different types of treatment. So just saying beaver mimicry restoration, well, that's a whole bag of tricks that you can throw at the stream. And which ones work better? And in which settings do which ones work better? And so can we think about where we want to be doing this treatment and how we want to be doing this treatment just based on some real simple generic sandbox type modeling? So here's my sandbox over on the side. It's a box 100 meters wide, one kilometer long, 10 meters thick, uh, broken up into two meter cells um, using weekly stress periods, daily time steps, and we've got the snow or the stream package. So this line going through the model is where the stream is going through, and I've got a snow melt driven hydrograph, which has base flow most of the year, and then a big peak during snow melt. And just for those like me who can't think in tens of thousands of cubic meters per day, this is varying from about 2 to 14 CFS for that stream. So a fairly small headwater stream. Uh, this is a sandy gravel that I'm modeling, so a hydraulic conductivity of about 25 meters per day, or I guess exactly 25 meters per day, because hey, it's a model, right? Uh, so 0.2 for the specific yield. I've got 95% of my groundwater inflow coming in as specified flux on the upstream end through the alluvium. The other 5% comes in along the lateral boundaries, and we've got a drain down here at the bottom. And I just said this stuff there. 
So within that box, we then do different types of treatments. And so I said, okay, let's, we're going to do a baseline with just the stream going through there. We're going to stick a structure on the stream. We've got the structure plus a near channel being activated, a far channel being activated, a bunch of the floodplain being inundated, or having an off-channel pool off to the side of the structure. So really a baseline and then five different treatment scenarios. And the way we do these is we've got the stream running through the model just like it was before, except when we add the structure, instead of having a constant slope to that stream going through it, I have a constant slope, then I do a flat step, and then I step down. And that's the whole deal for simulating the structure. Uh, when we've got the near channel, we just add a near channel, far channel, floodplain inundation. And then for the uh, off-channel pool, we've got a specified or a general head boundary that I put off to the side of the stream. And so that just has a step increase. I might as well put this up. So we've got this step increase in the spring where that would fill up from a side channel. And then it gets cut off when the stream flow falls below some uh, nick point or spill level. And then it slowly infiltrates throughout the summer. And so it hangs around for a lot longer than the uh, channels that are inundated for only a short period of time. And then we tested those five different scenarios or treatment types in gaining, losing, and strongly losing hydrologic settings to see how much of a difference does it make if we go out on the landscape and we're trying to pick what site do we spend our $10,000 on? Do we do it over here or do it over there? Uh, and so. At the end of the day, we've got a comparison here between the net change in stream flow in mid-August of year five is the top graph, and the change in the groundwater outflow is the bottom graph. So this is the mean annual groundwater outflow. And what we see is that in the gaining and the losing settings, we see these slight increases in the uh, surface water outflow in mid-August, and we see that all three of the uh, treatment levels increase groundwater outflow. But notice that the groundwater outflow increases the most when you've got a strongly losing stream because you've got a stronger gradient towards the stream. And also we see a slight decrease in the August surface water outflow because we put this structure out there that raised up that gradient for the structure so we're p pushing more water into the ground and it can't come out within the model domain. These next ones we can look at very quickly because they're virtually identical to just putting a structure out there. And the reason for that is that although we create a bigger groundwater mound when we inundate those side channels and with floodplain inundation, by the time we get to mid-August, that mound is gone. And so we pretty much, by the time we're uh, at that core area that we're interested in, these really don't make a lot of difference in late summer stream flows. You might get more riparian vegetation over a wider area, but that's not the water budget. And then we've got the last one, and it behaves totally different than the rest, and this is that pond off to the side of the channel, and as I mentioned before, that continues to hold water throughout the summer. So that groundwater mound that's created by inundating that sticks around until late August. It's still fully formed, and so we've increased those gradients and we can see this late summer effect of having that extra recharge out there. Again, cubic meters per day, kind of hard to wrap your brain around, so I put it in gallons per minute because that's a little bit easier to think about. So we got about one gallon a minute from all of these treatments, uh, or nothing in the strongly losing, up to about five to eight gallons a minute from that side channel. So a good garden hose worth of water is basically what you're getting extra for stream flow uh, from one structure by, through this modeling. So from the modeling, we see that clearly the off-channel pools create the greatest increases in stream flow and groundwater outflow, and the rest are pretty similar, and I already talked about that. Uh, also from the sensitivity analysis, which I'm not going to go through, uh, we can see that if we add evapotranspiration to the model, we can begin to get kind of those same ballpark of numbers being taken out by the plant. So if that water table starts out close to the land surface where the roots can get at the water and you bring that up, then that increase in evapotranspiration can offset 
that increase in stream flow that you would otherwise get. So you're kind of in that same ballpark for the two. So we know that these are competing with each other for the water. And uh, certainly if you want to get a more lush and vigorous riparian zone, it's okay that maybe you don't get the increase in stream flow. Uh, but that's just the trade-off of getting that vegetation to come in. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is monitoring that we've done at Alkali Creek and Long Creek. And so we've got Long Creek down here. We've got Alkali Creek up here. Also note the divide snow tell site is over there, which I'll uh, look at a little bit of the data from that as well. So at Alkali Creek, we've got uh, this treatment area where the black crosses show where the beaver mimicry structures went in. The rest is showing pisometers and surface water sites that we have out there. Uh, and also this control area down here. And we started monitoring on Alkali Creek in 2015 and then in August of 2016, the beaver mimicry structures went in. On Long Creek, it's a little bit more complex because we've got this lower control, the lower treatment, upper control, upper treatment, and then what I'm calling a beaver control because beaver were there before we showed up. And uh, so it makes a good reference area to look at. Uh, most of the monitoring I'm going to focus on is on Alkali Creek. Uh, we just have to choose something and talk about it, I guess. So this first thing I'm looking at is how do groundwater levels change in response to doing this treatment? And so I'm just saying, let's take a 30 centimeter threshold and which wells go over 30 and which ones don't. And so we can see that this is the area near the stream where the structures went in where we see this 30 centimeter rise or more in groundwater levels. Incidentally, 30 centimeters, almost exactly a foot. So it makes it something I can think about. Um, next, we go to 2018. So that was looking 2017 to 2016. If we go to 2018 versus 2016, we see this spreads out much more throughout the area, especially this area down here, which is a little wetland area. Uh, we see the water levels come up in there quite a bit. And then 2019, there's just crazy squiggly stuff going on here. And what's this whole embayment coming in here and weird things going on? Well, we'll, we'll get to it, I promise you. Uh, but it's an interesting story, I think. Um, the other way that we can look at this is rather than just looking at the change in groundwater levels is how does the potentiometric surface change? So these are potentiometric lines running through here. They're a half meter. Uh, interval, you can think of them just like topographic lines on top of the water table. So we're going downhill in this direction uh, and we can see the shape. We've got this mound going through the middle. We've got these little valleys off to the sides. And what we're seeing here is that the modern stream channel is one area that is draining the groundwater table. But we also have this old side channel over here that is also providing a drain uh, apparently so that Probably there are more coarse grained sediments over here that are also allowing the water to move through. We've got more fine grained stuff kind of running through the middle where we get these ridges. And we also have over in this area, this is a low spot. So both this and this are at the same elevation. And so flow splits between those two with some of it going to the stream up here and some of it going to this wetland and getting used by the plants down there. <clears throat> So then we go and we put a bunch of structures out there and the shape of the surface changes fairly dramatically. Um, we see a lot more water getting forced in near the structures and creating some pretty strange loop-de-loops -loops over here. We see the gradient over here has become much steeper than it was before and uh, generally this becomes more gaining down here and as we move through the next year it looks almost the same but then in 2019 we see a lot of these contours shift upstream, showing us that the groundwater levels dropped in much of the area. Well, that's similar to what we saw with the uh, 30 centimeter contour as well. And so if we look at a particular well, we can tell the story where we've got uh, this GW15 is this well right over here. And in 2016, we can see uh, how it changed throughout the year and right there is when the beaver mimicry restoration occurred 
and it, then the water level came up right after that. Uh, the following years, we have the water level in the spring is fairly similar, but we do see this transition. When we look kind of in the August time frame, we've got 2017, 2018, 2019. Each year it gets a little bit lower than it was the year before. Uh, until we get to that point, which is when T the day after we did our drone flights for that year, TNC went out and reinforced the structures because those sod mats and juniper boughs that were jammed down into the channel to create the beaver mimicry structures were starting to decay and starting to settle in over time. And if we just look at the hydrograph, this is a pool behind one of the structures um, up here. We can see this decline in the stage of the stream in that pool over time as that dam settles down. And so that's why we're seeing those changes in those levels over time, why 2019 fell off so much relative to the others. Of course, the other question to ask is, well, how do you know that it's not just the whole world that's changing? And so that's why we have the control. And so we can see here in the control area where water levels in each of the years are very similar to each other. And so another thing we can look at is on a transect going between these wells, how do the water levels change over time? And so 2016, we've got the orange line on the bottom here. 2017, we come into this blue line in here. And what we see is that on this side, the gradient towards the stream is actually flatter than it was before treatment. Yet over here, going away from the stream and towards the wetland, it's much steeper than it was before. So we actually have more water moving towards the wetland than we did before, away from, and more or less water moving towards the stream. When we go to the next year, the green line, the slopes are almost exactly the same as it was before the treatment. So we come back to that equilibrium with those gradients towards the stream and a similar amount of flow, let's see, laterally or longitudinally? Anyway, from the sides going towards the stream, uh, we've got the same amount of water coming in. However, this well down here at the very bottom has virtually no change in the water level in it. And so we've got a much steeper gradient between that well and the rest of them. So we've got a lot more water coming towards the stream down here. So along the length of the stream, we end up having this mound that builds up. But then at the very bottom, it's got a very steep slope that's feeding into the stream on the lower end. So another way that I wanted to look at this was looking at the net stream gains out there. So getting back to that question of are we increasing uh, late summer stream flows? Not merely are we increasing uh, groundwater levels, but what does it mean for stream flows? And so we've got uh, two surface water sites. This is that uh, A8SW1 that I showed that graph of. And this is just the downstream site. So above and below the treatment area. Uh, we can take a look at those and say, okay, what's the difference in flow between those two stations? And so each of these has a staff gauge. We developed rating curves, and uh, we can try and interpret the differences in discharge, which is always a ticklish business because you're kind of right at that limit of what you can really resolve. But we uh, see this 2016. We've got the discharge at the upstream station on the x-axis. We've got the change in flow on the y-axis. And so at higher flows, we have more loss. And as we get lower and lower flows, we see less total loss, which isn't too surprising because you've got a lower gradient pushing that water out into the system. But you pretty much for the whole thing have a losing stream throughout that reach. 2017, if anything, is even more losing than 2016 was. 2018 is doing something totally different. So we actually have gains occurring during high flows and actually gains during most of the time. And I think we see this in the other uh, potentiometric surface where it takes time for that aquifer to fill up. And then once it's full and we get to this, I should point out this is July through September, so we don't have spring data on here. But once we get out here, we've got that filled up aquifer, the stream levels are falling, and we begin to get those increased flows. Of course, 2018 was a relatively wet year. 
And uh, so I'm really anxious to see my 2019 data, which is now being collected by my transducers, and hopefully they don't freeze in. Uh, another thing that makes me actually believe that chart, because differential stream gauging I'm always a little skeptical about, but we can look at just the elevations of the stream. So this is at this downstream station. So the elevation of the stream is in blue. The red dots show the elevation of groundwater over those three years. And if we just integrate under those curves or between those curves, we can see that the uh, amount of time that the groundwater levels are higher than surface water levels increases. Well, maybe between 16 and 17, not much of a difference. And then 2018, we see that it perks right up, and then the amount of time that the groundwater levels are deeper than the stream levels, so when it would be losing, are reduced as we move through time. And so again, that supports the idea that we should be seeing a gain across this reach when we get down to 2018, but again, it takes time for that to show up. Okay, so getting back to our conceptual budget, um, the other thing, so we looked with modeling and monitoring at groundwater outflow, at surface water outflow, changes in storage or changes in water levels. And through modeling, we saw that ET is probably something we need to think about carefully on these. And so that's the part that I'm going to focus on next. And so what we did is we went out 2016 to 2019 and we collected drone imagery data. Uh, you can see these are about the same time of the month every year and we collected visible and near infrared imagery. And this is the little fixed wing drone that WET used to uh, collect that data. And this is my dog, Haas, for scale. And he thinks this is the best Frisbee ever. <laughs> so hold on to him. <laughs> okay, so from those data we can uh, calculate the normalized difference vegetation index, or NDVI. And that's the, taking the near infrared and comparing it to the red that's reflected off the ground. And what happens is the chlorophyll strongly absorbs red, which is why most vegetation doesn't look red, and it strongly ref reflects near infrared. And so you can think of near infrared like being super green, that it, if we could see in the near infrared, we wouldn't think the plants were green, we would think that they were near infrared. It's a, a very strong reflection there. And so we're taking the relationship between those two, and we can get this uh, scaling from minus one to one with live plants being in this 0.3 to 0.8 kind of range, uh, maybe a little higher or lower than that. But when you've got negative numbers or very low numbers, you're looking at snow or water. And so just as an example, we can go back out to Alkali Creek, look in this treatment area, and we're just focus in on this area with those three structures on it. And so using the visible wavelengths, we can look at it and we've got this before treatment and then after treatment, uh, it seems quite a bit greener, but it's really hard to quantify very much with seems greener. Uh, we can look at that same thing using the NDVI and it kind of washes out on this screen, I guess, but it looks somewhat greener. But the beauty of this is that now you have this raster to work with and you can subtract one from the other and see the difference in the NDVI from before and after, and we see kind of this band along the stream that is uh, greening up more than a lot of the other things. Though so with the more moisture that year, we certainly see that we have uplands that are greener than they were before as well. So of course it's nice to see that the vegetation really perks up as you do this, but not too surprising that you add water and plants grow better. I mean, I'm not a botanist, but I know that tends to work. Um, but what we're really trying to get at is this ET sub A, or uh, actual evapotranspiration. And in order to, to do that, first we need to rescale NDVI uh, from zero to one. We're gonna call it NDVI star. Uh, and then we take that NDVI star and we just have this simple relationship and we can rearrange it a little bit. But so this is reference evapotranspiration, which we get from nearby AgriMed stations. So they've got the meteorological data being collected to calculate reference evapotranspiration. And that's multiplied by NDVI and it's taken to this eta exponent. 
If we pretend for a minute that eta is 1, then this is what the relationship would look like. You just increase NDVI star, you increase your ETA to ET naught ratio, multiply by the reference ET for that day, and boom, you've got an actual evapotranspiration number. The reality is that eta, when you're doing NDVI, is not 1. It's around 0.6, almost certainly between 0.5 and 0.7. And so we sh I'm showing those curves up here. I'm also doing work with Landsat imagery now to get a better sense of what that exponent should be in our area. Um, but I'm not done with that yet, so for this talk, I'm going to call it 0.6. So using that relationship, we can go out to all those piezometers that we have in these uh, treatment and control areas and look at what is the depth to groundwater in that piezometer and how green is the vegetation around it? And that directly relates to what's this evapotranspiration uh, ratio that we're working with. And you know, not surprisingly, we see that as we get deeper groundwater, the greenness of the vegetation drops off. We also see that when we're between even up to 0.25 meters above ground surface with the groundwater level, down to three quarters of a meter below ground surface, the plants really don't care. They've got roots that are deep enough that they're just cooking along in that range. We've got pretty much this flat relationship going through this part of the curve. But when we get to the 0.75 meters, we begin to see that drop off in the evapotranspiration uh, at the sites. And this, to me, is kind of exciting because when I go to do the mod flow modeling, for those of you who've gone down that rabbit hole, uh, They've got the ETS package, and you can actually plug this relationship directly in. Rather than making up some number from literature, we actually have some numbers that we can base this off of. The other thing to note here is that the average going through here is about 0.83. What I th want you to think about is just 0.8 something. But you don't totally max out even when you've got water levels that are well above ground surface just because there's bare ground. There's differences in vegetation types. And the other thing that is obvious here is that there's a lot of scatter in that data. You know, your R squared, if you just took this part that's falling down, it'd be pretty lousy, right? Um, so obviously we've got more going on than just uh, depth to water. Uh, Robert and I have talked about what are the vegetation types near each of those piezometers, how much bare ground do you have, how much litter, we collected a bunch of data last summer. We're in the process of evaluating it. It's not as simple as I had hoped, but you know, it never is. Um, but there's obviously more going on than just depth to groundwater. So the other way that we can look at this data is, you know, we have this continuous. We've got five centimeter pixels, and we've got an ET value for each of them. So we can look at comparing the treatment areas to the control areas and see how much of a treatment effect are we getting out there, or how much more water are the plants using due to doing this restoration work. And so we've got the lower control, lower treatment, upper control, upper treatment, beaver control again on Long Creek, and I'd put a 10 meter buffer on either side of the stream going through there and said, okay, stuff near the stream, how much is the evapotranspiration changing in the treatment compared to the control? Did the same thing on Alkali Creek. I'm not doing the beaver control in here, even though there is a beaver complex, because it's kind of a jungle in there. And I would just be making up where I felt like the stream was if I went through there. So rather than doing that, we just have a treatment and a control. And as I mentioned before, here's the Divide Snowtell site. And uh, just keep in mind that 2015, the year before we did the treatment, was quite dry. 2016 was still on the dry side of normal. And then everything post-treatment has been average or above average precipitation. So welcome to life in the big city, right? You know, you can't ever have them match up. And the other thing that's going to influence this is how much has it rained recently. So right before we took the flights, I took the 30 days preceding the flights and said, how much precip did we get in each of these years? Just to have a comparison. And 2016, we're 0 0.4, 2017, 0.6, 2018.2. You know, same kind of ballpark, right? Obviously, I'm, you know. 
So in 2019, it just wouldn't stop raining. 2.1 inches of precip uh, before, in the 30 days before we did the flights. I was talking to a guy at uh, DNRC and he said, in Helena, they got more rain in August than they did in June this year. So it's a little bit of a weird year. Um, I'm, so just keep that in mind as we look at the results here. So here we're looking at the change in that ETA to ET naught ratio uh, in the treatments in the yellow colors and the controls in the blue and green. And so the first year, everything is roses. I mean, this is kind of what you hope to see when you do an experiment that, gee, the treatment responded and the controls didn't do much. And then we should have stopped and went home. Um, but 2018, we're now in the second year of the wet cycle, and we begin to see the control areas uh, catching up to the treatment areas. We still have more treatment effect than we do in the control, but it's uh, catching up. And in 2019, we actually see that this upper control and upper treatment are very similar as far as the change in that ratio. We still have this treatment as being much more uh, pronounced. But the reason for that is that started out being the lowest. So these are absolute values rather than change in those values. So we start out having the lowest value there and it comes up to be similar to the others. And so we get the largest change. Um, the other thing to notice is that things kind of max out. That once you get so green, you really can't get a whole lot greener. And so you've got this kind of arbitrary upper limit on how much change can you get. And so in relatively dry years or even early in the wet cycle, we see a very pronounced change, but as we get more precip and multiple wet years in a row, we begin to see the control and the treatment converge uh, over time. On Long Creek, or Alkali Creek, we see a very similar pattern uh, over time, except here the control actually exceeds the treatment in the final year. Again, all that rain that we got uh, before we did the flights and Alkali Creek treatment area was actually somewhat greener when we started, and so we see that the treatment is actually able to pass, or the control is able to pass the treatment in that year. But in general, we do see this treatment effect where we've got greener plants in the treatments versus the controls, so I'm just lumping everything together on here with all of Alkali Creek and all of Long Creek. Uh, we can look at the area that was treated in each of those and then multiply that out. So we've got this linear millimeters per day increase. Multiply it by the area treated and we get change in flow. And so we see almost no change during the wetter years up to about 12 gallons per minute uh, in the first year of the treatment. And so during dry years we see this higher change. And this is with either six or nine structures out there. So when we compare that to the modeling, we can see that we're in a similar ballpark, but the ET is somewhat less than the best treatment we might do based on modeling. And so the conclusions from the simple modeling was that the structures can create dynamic storage in the system, that we can uh, increase late summer flows, but it obviously depends on how you do the treatment and where you do the treatment. Uh, there's the potential also for longer term storage, that is that groundwater outflow that that water may not come back within the model domain that I was working with, but that doesn't mean it doesn't come out somewhere and at some time. It's just further downstream. And if we're worried about climatic change and drier, dry times and wetter, wet times, we may want to buffer over more of a decadal time scale rather than a seasonal time scale. Buffering it for a few months may not really be the recipe we're looking for. Uh, again, ob objectives for the treatment need to be thought out carefully uh, when you decide how to do this. Um, we saw that those off-channel pools created about five to eight gallons per minute for a single structure. And we saw that ET uh, could be comparable to those increases in flow. Uh, looking at the monitoring data, we see the groundwater levels come up in response to that raised stream stage. We see that the annual amplitude of that groundwater signal becomes more buffered because it's limited to being between the stream stage and the water or the land surface that you can't move beyond those two end members. And so we end up having less amplitude in that annual storage, which means we may actually have 
less water going into and coming out of storage on an annual basis even though there's more water in storage. You know, we've got a higher groundwater level than we had before. Um, note that several years are needed to see the ultimate effects. You know, don't expect to do these and monitor for one year and say, yep, there's the story. Uh, we certainly have on Long Creek where that beaver control is. Between our treatment and our control year, we had water levels in the control go up by almost a meter in the beaver control because of beaver dams that were built two years earlier. And it just finally worked its way out to those. Um, also, late summer stream flows appear to increase uh, following treatment. I hate to hang my hat on that very much because differential stream flow measurements are awfully hard to truly believe, but the fact that the groundwater levels tie in with that makes me think that that's probably a real thing and the modeling also supports that. Um, but it is difficult to quantify by itself. Uh, looking at remote sensing, we see that where plant vigor is limited by water availability, we can get a more lush and extensive riparian zone, mainly due to the decreasing that depth to groundwater. And we're looking at that almost no change to about 12 gallons per minute within these treatment areas. Now these treatment areas had six to nine structures. So when we compare that with the modeling that shows that a single structure can give you one to eight gallons per minute. Okay, so if we multiply one by nine, we end up nine. You know. Obviously, we're in that same order of magnitude where we need to be thinking about these things together and that if you ignore evapotranspiration, you're missing an important part of the story. And so when I go on to do the site-specific models, I'm going to have to uh, pay close attention to how that part is set up. And so we get back to this uh, water budget and we know that as we do these, we're trying to get more of the surface water to go into the aquifer so that it can be stored and come out later. And we see through the modeling that groundwater outflow increases with both the modeling and monitoring. We can see surface water flows increasing. We see that evapotranspiration increases and we see that the amount of water in storage increases, but the amplitude on an annual basis may decrease. And so it's important to think about the whole water budget when you're dealing with a problem like this because if you just kind of do the arm waving, well, if we increase recharge, we're going to increase discharge and then it will happen magically in the late summer right when we need it. You know, don't hold your breath. You know, there's a lot of other things that can happen. And I just wanted to close by looking at this one area on Long Creek where here we are in 2015. Now we're going to put a beaver mimicry structure in down here and it greens up and then we went out this year and the beaver had come in and actually built a dam on top of our beaver mimicry structure and created this much more extensive wetland than we could have done on our own. Uh, and I actually have a video of this, of this if people want to watch it, but right now I'll take any questions. Thank you.